I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. So, Kaifu, I so much enjoyed this AI 2041. What a brilliant idea of Thank basically you. taking a well-known science fiction author, Chen Kifan. Is that how you say his name? Kifan? Chufan. And uh, offer of waste tide. I feel like there's been in the past 10 years, 15 years, maybe it's just the translations that have been happening, but there's this huge wave of like brilliant science fiction written in China lately. You know, and, and I don't even know if, how, if people know, like movies like Arrival were originally, I think that was a Ken Liu story. And so you, you decided to go this route of not just examining AI from this academic point of view. And of course, I've known you for a long time. You're an AI genius in every possible way, but you didn't just write some boring textbook. You took all these very interesting questions about what, how AI could change the near future. You took a great science fiction writer, joined forces with them, and he basically wrote up these scenarios and gave them life and gave the characters life. They're beautiful stories, well written and and well done. It's a page turning book as a science fiction collection of stories. But it also raises all these really interesting questions of AI. How did this project come to be? It's very unique. Yeah, it was an idea from um, uh, my my company. You know, our day job is uh, venture capital, but our marketing team has a couple of people who know that I have this uh, love to express myself. And uh, I wanted to write another book. I felt uh, my last book, AI Superpowers, was uh, reasonably popular and uh, perhaps because it was readable. But I had reached um, my abilities in readability. And if I wanted the ideas about AI to be better understood, I needed to partner with someone who could be much better than me in uh, storytelling. And so we found that Chufa. Yeah, because he really, like, it's very easy to say, this is what could happen with AI insurance, but it's, but it's another thing when you give characters decisions in their life are made by, uh, uh, by well-written characters. And so you feel what they're feeling that their love life might be affected or that, you know, their jo- career decisions or, you know, and, and, you know, in terms of the monarch who's looking for some sort of contentment or enlightenment in the question of what is happiness, these are not once it, once it's written by a, a, an author, yeah. it's fiction really is the truth told with lies. And <laughs> yeah. 
So it's a way of telling this truth that we all relate to, even if it's through a fictional character. And so it makes you really think, wow, that could happen to me. And so, I mean, so let's start going through some of these questions that you raise and I won't give away any, any plot, uh, secrets or anything, but let's talk about the AI insurance one, which is the very first story where basically a family's insurance rates are modified depending on how much data they give the insurance company. And of course you could see almost in real time how decisions they make affect insidiously their insurance rates. Right, right. I mean, people read a lot about, you know, Cambridge Analytica and how evil that is. But actually, um, AI's power is that it can take into consideration so many things, um, you know, tens of thousands of features and, and then use it to influence us. And you could think that it's trying to be benign, right? If you think about an insurance company, their goals are um, ostensibly aligned with ours. They want us to be healthy. We want to be healthy. And, and they give us reward for doing good things to be healthy. What could possibly go wrong? So the story tells a particular situation where a particular person's a loved interest uh, would be is perceived by AI to be bad for her. And then it tries to do all kinds of things to obstruct that love story from developing. So, you know, from an AI standpoint, it's trying to minimize your risk of, uh, you know, uh, uh, problems to your health and it's ought to be good for you, but it's actually hurting our, you know, freedom of choice. So it shows that their AI's ability to reason based on tens of thousands of features and has uh, uh, ways to essentially help us, but also manipulate us, uh, needs to uh, be cautiously monitored and we need to do things to uh, minimize the negative effect while maximizing its power. Yeah. And it's not, it's, it's very interesting because this is in some ways explores um, the issues of literally systemic and I'm putting systemic in quotes, systemic racism. And I hate to use that phrase because it's not really well-defined, but yeah. it, it's almost more defined in the context in this book where an actual system might not know it's making decision decisions based on race or demographics or whatever, but it might turn out, for instance, that if I marry someone who's 20 years younger than me, I'm just saying, if, if a man mm-hmm. marries someone who's, who's 20 years hy- hypothetically younger, uh, it could be the case that that is very much anti longevity for that person. Who knows? I'm just making up these statistics, but just, when you share your conversation with the insurance, and this becomes an issue in the story where the girl decides to share her actual conversations that she's having, the Mm -hmm. AI knows intimately, literally what you're interested in romantically and how that could affect, you know, based on the statistics it has, your longevity or your career choices or your opportunities in life or your, your, the chances you're going to be homeless and adjust your insurance accordingly. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you like this story. It is kind of a, an extension of the documentary Social uh, Dilemma, which yes. I, a lot of people watched. But I think people understood, okay, how you know Google and Amazon could do things to try to make more money because their goals are not aligned with yours. They're trying to make money. We're trying to search for content or you know browse our friends' um, posts or buy something. Uh, it's not aligned. Therefore, AI can twist things because it has different goals than you. So this story attempts to show that even if your goals are very well aligned, uh, AI is so smart, it will take uh, very uh, small hints. And in this story, actually, the um, uh, it, it's... The, the database, the data has been cleansed so that the racial information is not there, but yet it's still inferred and, and made it into a factor. So it is intended as a, a double warning on the potential dangers of AI. And, and, and you know, the story was a little controversial because some people read it and said, well, where's the science fiction? Um, but, but I felt the 10 stories needed to be developed from the most basic, uh, what is already here today, and then to the most advanced so that people can essentially get a, a course, uh, a layman's course on AI. So we started out and Chou Fan was brilliant in taking what is a plain story, an extension of uh, Social Dilemma, and, and really turned it into a dramatically interesting. Yeah, and uh, 
you know, it, it, it's interesting because um, for some of these stories, the technology exists now to do this. Right. Like to right. do, if, if I, for instance, carried around a, a some sort of recorder and recorded all of my actual conversations during the day with people, insurance companies or marketing companies or anything could have a field day with that. Like if, if, if I start saying, if I start saying to my friends, Hmm, that's a nice car over there. Hmm. Who knows? Maybe if it's a red car that I pointed at, maybe my insurance rates go down, but yeah. I mean, my insurance rates go up because red uh -huh. cars have more accidents and, but maybe car salesmen call me like, mm -hmm. and I feel with a lot of these technology issues, it's all, it's always very good intentions. Like, like you even point out in the story, you know, lives are being saved by lower insurance rates when, when they, people share their data, but, but, so, but you can't really regulate goodness. So good intentions, whether it's from a business or from a government is going to have some downside mm -hmm. that's unforeseen. And that's what they yeah. with all of these stories here. Yeah. And actually there is another story that uh, talks about people who kind of figured out how the AI worked so that they talk in a, in a, in a, in a way so as to trick the AI into thinking they're good. So, so it could uh, go the other way as well. Well, well, you know, so this comes up and uh, maybe you're referring to the, the, the story about deep fakes and how, again, this is a technology that exists now where you could take of any video and put anybody's face on it and give that person speech and have it, the AI lip sync so that the face looks normal. And that's a deep fake video. It's very hard to, t and it's, it, get, it gets more and more complicated as software is developed to detect deep fake videos. Other software is developed often hand in hand to yeah. uh, develop even more advanced deep fake videos. These, uh, uh, ad, you know, adversarial neural networks that you talk about in the, in the book. And by the way, I should mention, you do a very good job describing the AI in between each chapter. And, and uh, it's like a less, like you say, it's a, it's like a masterclass in AI combined with these beautifully written stories. But w I feel like in the long run, it does paint a bleak picture. It's always good intentions, but we have mm -hmm. no hope ultimately of detecting, <clears throat> you know, in the long run, deep fake mm -hmm. AI or virtual reality that is indistinguishable from the real world and so on. Well, it's kind of like um, uh, virus software and antivirus. In, in that case, I think the good guys largely won uh, because the, the large data collected and the instant updating essentially suppressed the virus problem for the great, great majority of the people with a small percentage of victims who's um, uh, being victimized becomes data and hint to prevent other people from becoming victimized. Deepfake is, as you said, a lot harder because it's kind of a competition on who's got more compute power. Um, it's the same technology that can detect the fa fakeness <clears throat> that can also be used in turn to make, it, to make the fakeness more real. So it's a competition of who's got more compute power. The problem is the good guys have to defend against all fakes. The bad guys just have to make one fake really, really hard to detect. So it does paint the bleak, bleak picture uh, if you extrapolate uh, without a uh, breakthrough in technology. So that's why in the tech explanation, I also showed at least one way that if we actually use blockchain technology that authenticates um, every picture as when it was captured, uh, that could someday uh, lead to the fact that at least we can show whether a picture or a photo or a, um, a video has ever been altered since this time of capture. Um, of course, that's not the um, panacea necessarily, but it's also only one way. So I like to still hope there are new technologies that can solve the problem. But uh, you're very much right that based on the current uh, adversarial uh, te technology, GANs, uh, it does seem like the, the good guys won't be able to usually, or at least certainly not always, catch the bad guys uh, differently from the antivirus situation. Now, you know, I, I want to skip ahead to one of the later uh, stories, but I don't want to give any stories away. But what do you see as the future of money and how it relates to AI? Like, this is a very interesting discussion. And you mentioned yeah, actually, blockchain. Yeah, so I think that actually is becomes more of a social question <clears throat> and a uh, anthropological questions 
um, rather than a technology question. It seems like logically speaking, one of the things I'm predicting for the future is that if you think about, you know, why was money ever invented? It is so that uh, products which are in increasing levels of scarcity can be priced so that they can be bartered and exchanged among people. However, there is a trend now accelerating that is causing uh, products to be made for lower and lower prices. And that comes from three parts. One is um, a materials revolution that um, scientists can build new materials out of lower cost and greener materials, one molecule at a time. Second is an energy revolution where the cost of energy will plummet as the improvements in solar and um, uh, battery storage improves. And the third is that the labor will become almost free as automation and robots take over the production of goods. So if you combine these three trends and project towards uh, something close to a post-scarcity world, then if in an altruistic society, if most things can be made for almost for free, then it seems like the good thing is poverty and hunger ought to go away. And that the need for money becomes less important because you would only use money to buy things that are truly scarce, like a uh, Van Gogh painting or something like that. Um, but, but then there is the thousand, thousands of years of habit that we have uh, of uh, collecting money, saving money. Money is a status symbol, money as an object of desire, and money as a way to compete against each other for, for ego and power. Um, and also companies have been known to create um, artificial scarcity, like diamonds are not really scarce, but De Beers chooses to only mine a small percentage a year and then do marketing to make it desirable and scarce. So how do we, so can we actually get it, get there, the road towards eradication of um, hunger and poverty, that all people can live a respectable life, despite our bad habits and despite the uh, historical record that um, that companies, private companies, don't behave well when it comes to, to, to the costs of their products plummeting, that they're more inclined to convince people that their product is still scarce and worth a lot of money, even when it's not. Right. And so... You know, people talk about how they use they use almost an old fashioned way of looking at economics. Like, okay, money supply has been printed, and so there's going to be inflation. But I think people have not really economists in particular have not factored in that the extreme rise in productivity, first from the internet and now in particular from AI, has reduced wage pressures considerably across almost every industry. I mean, you could start off with the IT industry. There was no, no more need for network engineers because it's all the internet protocol. But then you're going to take it all the way up to blockchain and money and you know projects developed with Ethereum and then projects developed with AI for, for, for instance, insurance or scanning you know x-rays or driving cars or planes or whatever. So there's going to be high-end jobs eliminated or at least moved around and this is this is, puts a huge deflationary pressure on the world economy absolutely and you know in fact most economic theories uh, will become outdated yes. as the idea of scarcity slowly goes away uh, so but yet i think you know we've um, we've had hundreds of years built on these economic theories whether you're a believer in you know adam smith or keynesian or marxists uh, they're all based on the idea that products are increasingly scarce. And, and when that idea is gone, we really do need a, a, new, a new theory and also along with it, a new way to motivate people because many people live for the job or the status or the wealth that they have, but yet all of those are uh, being radically shifted in the next 20 years or so. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. 
travel clothes. I'm tra- I, I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half. And I just took mizzen and main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from mizzen and main. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a mizzen and main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main dot com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual 
class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You have a story, the job savior, and the word savior is very appropriate here because if you think about it, throughout history, man has been not only on a quest for food and security and safety, but also on a quest for meaning. We, we, we rise up in our tribe based on our ability to find meaning and then fulfill that meaning, to, to execute on that meaning in our lives. And like you mentioned, job and even money as, as a sign of status these are often ways we have found meaning in modern society, in a secular society. You know, as AI displaces more and more of the things we've spent hundreds of years specializing in, what do you see as our quest for meaning? How does that change? And you, you deal with this in several stories. Uh, yes. So I think the general theme that I try to um, uh, promote is that of Maslow hierarchy that our meaning uh, needs to evolve from the base levels of uh, survival um, and then substance, uh, sub subsistence up towards uh, love and um, connectivity and then um, dignity and respect and then self-actualization. So that we, uh, there are multiple ways of getting there. I think one is um, basically create more jobs and opportunities that connect us to each other because after all, that is one unique aspect of, peop of people that we have feelings and love and trust that cannot be replaced by machine and AI. Um, another is through some artificial mechanism like money that encourages encourage us to move, move in that direction. Um, and then there is a possibility that people can really follow their passion and and, and essentially earn their um, respect and uh, equivalent of wealth uh, without having to do a job that has an economic value to the society, whether it is homeschooling uh, your children or providing service to the to a, a, fo a foster home or a elderly home uh, or being doing a job in a virtual world which has no economic value other than uh, one, to keep you uh, satisfied that you are contributing, even when you may not be. But secondly, to sharpen your skills so that you can become someone who's good at a job. So the, the question that we try to solve in that story, Job Savior, is that if AI is taking all the routine jobs, basic jobs away, then all the entry-level accountant jobs are gone. But senior financial people are still needed. Basic paralegal jobs are gone, but experienced lawyers are still needed. But how does a lawyer, an accountant, a uh, financial analyst ever become a superstar unless they had the training at a base level? So the idea is that people can uh, work in a virtual community in a basic level and essentially be watched by AI 
for those who have talent, then they can be elevated to higher status. While most of the people will continue to do work that they think contributes value, but actually、uh, AI can do a better job, and 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 perhaps they can work together, and perhaps or perhaps some people's work are just thrown away, and AI will redo it, but kind of create a sense that they are contributing. So these are all the ideas. I don't know which ones will work. There are other people who would suggest that the time has come for a new religion,、um, and and that might be another another path. But but one way or another, we're going to have to deal with this drastic shift in what has motivated us for the last thousand years、uh, may no longer be around to motivate us. Yeah, because you know you you mentioned Maslow's hierarchy, but even parts of that hierarchy could be outsourced to AI. So for instance. Let's just—I'm just going to take hypothetically friendship, but it could apply to romance. I could record all the conversations I have for the next year, and then I could label them. This conversation made me feel good. This conversation made me not feel good. And、mm-hmm. you know, an AI could kind of break out semantically the characteristics of the paragraphs or conversations or people that made、right. me feel good versus not feel good. And the technology to make a virtual friend. Will become better and better, and that's not so far fetched, even、yeah. with today's technology, with like GPT three and so on. I mean, I feel like they're almost holding back,、uh, re- re- fully releasing that technology for these reasons.、Uh, yeah, well, I think what you just described what、well, could be a, a a nice story <laughs> in the next in the book that you could write.、Uh, yeah, I I think、uh, the measure of your happiness actually what you describe is is very likely to be doable. Um, and and it doesn't even have to require you to label what made you happy, right? Because、uh, it, it knows in the brain. Oh, dopamine just got released. So let's have these conversations in the morning, and and these in the evening、yeah. when serotonin are released. Exactly. So the hormones, which are just scratching the surface, and much more brain science will help、um, understand what stimulate us and make us happy, and also simple things like watching our facial expression. Uh, you know、uh, what the police profilers are very good at doing,、um, and AI can do a much much better job in watching micro expressions.、Uh, these are expressions that are microseconds and not usually detectable by normal people, but AI can detect it. Might be a flicker of、um, particular way you blink or a particular way your、uh, eyes look at a particular direction, or may- maybe、um, humidity. Maybe we're sweating. Maybe our pupils are dilating. So AI could be watching all of that. And、uh, learning to make us happy again, something that sounds good because we want to be happy. But then, how? Whether are we moving towards a world where AI controls、uh, controls us and we become mere puppets? So that's、um, the double-edged sword. But but it's a real interesting thing. So in 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 the study of positive psychology,、uh, they don't use the word happiness; they use the word well-being, and it, and、mm. and it consists of three components. You know, according to this this field of positive psychology, one is Community. So, how closely do you interact, and positively do you interact with your community?、Uh, mastery. So, how people feel good when they get better at a skill, whether it's a skill that makes money or a, a game like tennis or whatever.、Uh, and the third one is、um, it's escaping me right now. But but I I want I brought it up because I wanted to talk about mastery for a second. And you have a, a story on AI based education. It seems like an AI based education. Is again doable now, and we haven't even begun to look into this. Like, imagine learning the piano. An AI is going to be much more in tune with: Did he just play the scales correctly? And、mm-hmm. could then modify the exercises as such to hone in on what part, what scales did I mess up, or how am I not?、Uh, you know, it could optimize the exercises so that whatever weaknesses it spots in my play, it could. Optimize them on a minute by minute basis, and change the exercises, and challenge me in different ways until it finally starts giving me pieces, and then I could understand where am I going wrong, where am I not feeling the emotion, where am I not, you know, where I, where am I just one sixteenth of a second off? So I feel like AI based learning, we're we're in inning zero, but that's going to be a huge component in terms of well being because we 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 love getting good at things. Uh, yeah, I think、um, edu- the field of education can be significantly improved by AI. A lot of what teachers do, AI can do better, and and that includes uh, both um, 
the, uh, the ability to, to detect areas in which a student might need to help. Uh, and, and as you know, in classes, sometimes students are far um, advanced of where the class is going and wanted to go faster. Other students want, want to go slower. And uh, AI allows for a uh, personalized, targeted tutor training lesson class that's exactly at the speed you need and also making up for anything that you may be uh, falling behind so that you can continue uh, your growth. For example, if you need more multiplication drills before you can learn division, it will give that to you, whereas in a class, it, it cannot. It can also detect when a student is maybe not paying attention and um, maybe um, dozing off, and then it needs to find new ways. It can also appeal to a student's uh, preference so that to a student who loves um, basketball, then all the math questions can be recast in basketball and sports or Olympics, or uh, and also maybe even uh, uh, if, if for another student who loves superheroes, then, then he or she can become a superhero playing a game while learning math at the same time. So I feel all of this can go such a long way um, and it doesn't at all um, impact the need for human teachers. Because as you mentioned, there's a community that there is the need for students to learn how to uh, communicate, to win trust, to make friends, to persuade. Um, and that can only be taught with uh, people to people, uh, environments and practices that could be led by a, a teacher who is not about one to many teaching, but about creating scenarios in which learning can take place. And of course, there are things like uh, improve, uh, 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 basically uh, igniting the curiosity, critical thinking and creativity. So teachers will become essentially catalysts to move uh, students in those directions and providing a personal coaching that connects to the student. So arguably you'll need even more teachers, but they may be more like mentor coaches, less like um, a domain experts giving lectures. Yeah, it's good. I feel like, I mean, obviously these this was great material for fiction, but I feel this is great material for understanding what businesses to start looking at in the near future. And by near future, I mean five, five years, say, to start. Like, for instance, this idea of, of AI education being very um, catered to my individual actions and motions and, and exercises and so on, I, I feel, again, there's, there's some foreign language, you know, applications that already do this, but, you know, learning foreign languages, but learning piano, learning, um, you know, a sport, learning uh, 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 more nuanced, even creative things, which people enjoy to learn. I don't think that we're even in any one of this yet. And that is a, a multi-trillion dollar market. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Um, it has some challenges because education is one of the elements of our society that is most resistant to change. Um, if, if you think about, um, you know, imagine what entertainment was like 100 years ago versus today. Imagine what um, communication uh, work uh, was 100 years ago versus today. They've completely been revolutionized. But education still largely takes place uh, around the world as a one teacher uh, giving lectures to many students because that's proven to work. And it's understandable why people are conservative about education because it's a product that doesn't get measured for you know, something like 15, 20 years. You, you know, only then do you know whether it has worked, whether people who, kids who went through this education ended up becoming um, a con positive contributors to society. So, so people are very hesitant to change education. So on the one hand, I agree with you, uh, AI is so such so ready for such a big change. On the other hand, the conservative aspect of society, people's resistance to change education, I think may uh, stifle its growth. Uh, but but we'll see. And also, there's there's issues with uh, raising children. So let's say you want your child to be uh, a, a piano prod, a violin prodigy, and so now instead of hiring a coach one hour a week, you could mm -hmm. have twenty four seven an AI coach, you know, where you say, you know, get, get back to work on the violin. You know, you have more exercise. The AI says you have 27,000 exercises to do. And so well, that, hopefully, 
yeah, hopefully that AI will also detect when the when the parents' dream are not uh, either realizable or that the, the 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 child may have some other passion that's more suitable, and um, and and say, okay, we're going to try to coach you in some other direction that fits your interests. All of this borders on good intentions or insidious. When you've watched a tiny kitten grow into a healthy senior cat, you remember why you chose Cat Chow. Because it's backed by 60 years of expertise. Cat Chow makes yummy formulas for cats of all ages, which makes me one happy cat mom.